Okay. Well, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Vinch. I'm with uh, Time Warner Cable, and I'm going to talk about configuring Swift um, with Puppet Swift. First things first, I have all these slides available here. So get a picture of this one. You can download them. I left the speaker notes on there to uh, make it pretty easy to look at at home. I've worked on uh, deploying and operating Swift for about four years now. Um, I'm part of a DevOps team at Time Warner Cable who own the design, deployment, and operation of an OpenStack cloud. Um, it's used to support mainly internal customers and some external customer-facing operations. So this talk is really meant to be a blueprint um, for those considering using Puppet for an initial deployment of Swift, as well as for someone who wanted to transition away from another tool set to a Puppet-managed tool set. So the uh, TWC cloud, just a little background on production cloud there. It's um, four replicas across two regions. It's only about 24 nodes per region. We do have uh, many expansions planned and some in progress right now. This was really set up um, for high availability and disaster recovery with uh, two replicas in each region, allow customers to access stuff even if one of the regions blew up or something. Um, it's good for a really broad range of object sizes and throughput. It's not necessarily a performance tune cluster. Um, but for example, it backs things like cloud, uh, a cloud drive on employee desktops so they can just share files that way. I believe sender volume backups are on there and some customer facing web pages. So it sees all ranges of traffic, small, big, videos, whatever. Um, on the side, we're also working on standing up an erasure coded based cluster. This is also using some new features in Puppet Swift um, that I'm developing. And we'll probably use that for a more high performance setup, uh, maybe for some video content. So at TWC, um, we use Puppet, Ansible, and Jenkins, and Docker to deploy uh, our OpenStack cloud. And I found that Puppet was a pretty good fit uh, for deploying Swift. Um, some founding members of our team in this room, uh, Clayton, Matt, they had already set up a pretty good Puppet infrastructure and deployment pipeline, so uh, it was a natural fit to try to move away from another solution to a Puppet solution for Swift. Um, a lot of the Puppet OpenStack modules were started by a guy named Dan Bode. He um, really had a lot of the early development. Since then, there's 50 different active contributors or more on the Puppet OpenStack modules. And just in the last year, they've also been moved under the OpenStack Big Tent. So um, they're the real deal. They support um, Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, CentOS operating systems. I know there's some, some other variations people use them <laughs> for. Uh, the Puppet OpenStack team, it's led by Emilia Mashi. He's the PTL, and he helps drive weekly meetings and design objectives and interaction with the rest of the OpenStack community. Um, when I began looking at the Puppet Swift module, I found out that a lot of the examples were really generic, and there was no real guidance on sort of how to piece that all together, um, because Swift is so flexible and can fit so many different applications. So this is really supposed to be a blueprint for how you would piece together Swift, and then also some supporting services on those nodes to monitor your Swift and make sure um, it's operating correctly. So um, I start off with um, describing some what I call deployment patterns, and then we'll step through a few other different sections that will build out a complete deployment. Um, this all assumes, though, that you do have what I would call as a base node uh, profile, something on your nodes that can provide uh, package repos, uh, IPMI tools, KDump, network configuration, just general sysadmin type of stuff. Um, from there, though, Swift can be pieced together in what I, I consider two main uh, patterns that I'd cover here that cover quite a bit of use cases. First one being a general deployment pattern where your proxy node runs just proxy services, object node runs account, container, and uh, object services. And then there's a slightly more tuned uh, one called performance deployment. This is maybe for a situation where you have many small objects and uh, container lookups are slow, you'd like to speed them up. In this case, you move the account and container servers over to the proxy node and host them on an SSD drive. Uh, Puppet Swift will support however you want to piece this together. I'm just going to step through these two main cases since they, um, 
there are a majority of, of situations you'd hit. Puppet Swift uh, itself contains a lot of different classes and defined types that you can use to configure the Swift service. So kind of step through those. Um, it's, first, it, it's good to understand at first the Puppet role and profile uh, design paradigm. And a quote from Gary Lariza of Puppet Labs said, a uh, puppet profile is simply a wrapper class that groups higher lookups and class declarations into one functional unit. A profile exists to give you a single class you can include that will set up all the necessary bits for that piece of technology, versus a role is just the mapping of host names to what the nodes actually do. You include profiles in a role. So this assumes that you're using a similar sort of pattern. I think most people are these days, but it's good to look at. So we're going to spend some time really stepping through each of these. These are the uh, core of the Swift functionality that you'd be con uh, configuring on your nodes. And then we'll look at supporting services to back that stuff up. So these are abbreviated uh, profiles for uh, the uh, object and proxy nodes. And I'm just going to kind of step through and tell you what they include. Some of them um, install packages for you. Some set up configuration files. Uh, you'll notice that I didn't leave every attribute in that I'm configuring this these with, because that's very specific to your environment. However, if you were to look at each of these classes in the Git repo, they will describe a default parameter and what that does. So I'd encourage you to just sort of step through that and find out what you need, or find me an IRC, and I can uh, help you with that. The proxy node, we start off by install, um, including the Swift class. That includes uh, the distro-specific Swift package, as well as uh, the Swift comp file. It's required by all the other classes, so it's sort of the first thing you'll include in your profile. The next is the Swift proxy class. And that does, uh, you know, installs the Swift proxy package, as well as proxyserver.conf. And this will work you know, on Red Hat or Debian, whatever. It just sort of abstracts that away from, uh, from you. Um, on a proxy node, you need a lot of different middleware to provide things, maybe dynamic large objects, auth token, whatever that is. And those are actually configured in individual classes. And you'll notice that they are their own separate class. Each one of those you'd include in this proxy manifest and set some attributes, and they all end up basically in proxy server.conf, kind of give you that functionality. Uh, an outside module that we have to include next that's not part of Puppet Swift is memcached, and this is used to cache uh, auth tokens on the proxy nodes and sort of speed up that uh, account lookup um, under high load. Uh, for memcached, you now include Swift proxy cache. That's a list of the IPs, basically a list of all your proxy nodes in the cluster that have memcached running on them so that they can talk to each other. And this is, again, assuming you're using Keystone. If you're not, there's some other modules you can use with this. Uh, Swift Proxy Keystone actually configures the user that Swift uses to talk to Keystone and authenticate tokens coming into Swift from a user. And Swift Proxy Auth Token is how you configure what endpoint Swift should validate against for Keystone. So this has you know, your proxy server up and running, validating tokens, um, sending it out to object nodes. Next down the line is um, some monitoring stuff that we'll look at in a little bit. That's Swift Dispersion. This is a class that um, configures Swift Dispersion Populate, um, as well as the comp file needed to run that. And then a generic section I have called Sync Rings. We're also going to dive into since there's just a whole lot of directions you can go with that. Kind of just abbreviated it there. Uh, on the object nodes, there's similar stuff included. We include the Swift class to get the Swift package. Uh, the next thing, though, is a wrapper class that I'll also dive into later, and I call it mount drives. What this does is basically mount ring devices to uh, drives on your node and do that mapping for you. Uh, on, on the general deployment pattern, we want all of the different object uh, servers, right? So we want object, account, and container all on the same node. There's a class Swift Storage All that will do this for you. You can further customize each of those servers by calling it out as Swiss, Swift Storage Server. And the port name, or the, the port is the name of the server. So that's how you reference you know, which server you're tuning. Is if you look into that class in Swift Storage All, you'll see those are the default ports that are used and pretty common across Swift. 
Uh, final two things in the object node there, swiftdriveaudit.conf and a cron for Swift Recon. These are important monitoring tools to, to have, and we'll look at them in the Isinga section a little bit more. All right, so stepping ahead here to uh, the difference in the performance deployment. So here, you, you wouldn't want to include Swift Storage all on either node because you're actually splitting the account and container servers out from the object server. And this is very similar. Uh, instead, you instantiate each server with the port number, and then it's required that you pass in the server type. So you'll see in the proxy node, I've now uh, put type container, type account, and it's going to be running those servers. It's going to have those packages installed, those configuration files, et cetera. The object node now is just running the object server. So that's how you'd split that out. And again, this is where you, you take your account and container ring and you run it on SSD drives on the proxy nodes so they have more direct uh, read access. It's a lot faster. Um, in benchmarking I've done, it's a significant improvement. So how you handle ring deployments also very unique to your environment and the, kind of the situation you're in there. Uh, Puppet Swift does contain a bunch of different classes and stuff that are used to dynamically build and rebalance a ring. A lot of this is done with exported resources. So for example, you declare on a node, I have a ring device, it's this drive, and it's got this name, Puppet runs, the resource is exported, the ring builder node would then take that and build a new ring and push it out. Uh, it's helpful for a small development cluster, maybe a virtual cluster you're just testing code out on. I know some people do use this a little more widely, but I really prefer to have very strict um, calculated changes to my rings that I do outside of the cluster. So I'll use Swift Ring Builder, which is you know, a core Swift tool. I'll, I'll modify the rings. I'll put them up on a blob server in our environment. And then you use the wget uh, puppet module to pull those rings down to your node. Puppet Swift will notify any Swift classes that need to restart um, when those rings change, and it's good. Uh, I do key this though, right? So rings are keyed based on the cluster name and a ring version that I store in Hiera. So I'm you know, controlling which ring to pull down and when. An even more secure method that I've done in previous deployments that I'd like to do in Puppet is using the MD5 sum of the ring and telling Swift only load the rings if their MD5 sum matches this pattern. This really ensures you're not accidentally pulling down the wrong file, which could be catastrophic depending on uh, how you have that set up. So the device drive mapping was a little tricky. I had inherited a cluster where device names were pretty random. Some of them were sequential, some of them were all over. So if I'm re-imaging this node with Puppet, how do I tell, tell it which drive IDs to mount? Um, what I did is just create a little wrapper class around Swift Storage XFS here. You see, I then use a, a YAML file in Hiera, which is all the object node names, or for example, the proxy nodes if they have account and container drives. I pass in a hash of the drive name to mount on, and then the device ID associated in the ring. So this now becomes the source of truth for the ring in this environment. I actually uh, generate new rings from this YAML file, just kind of feed it in there. Um, this allows me to sort of take Puppet and drop it in place of whatever was managing it before. Uh, you know, a more sane method if you're starting a new cluster is obviously some dynamic uh, device naming. You, uh, device name is object node device zero to one, and you just store those in the ring. That way you don't ever have to do any mapping. It's just assumed that drives are mounted based on name and incremental drive number, and that would save you the trouble of having to map it out later. But just want to point out this is a pretty simple way to do it. It's worked well for us in production, and we'll continue to do it. Next, uh, look at some basic monitoring. So you've got Swift running on your nodes. You've got rings on there. Uh, you don't have whatever previous monitoring was on that node because you ripped it out. So you need some basic Isinga checks to sort of sanely monitor this cluster. Uh, we at TBC we use Isinga to pump warnings into uh, HipChat, and critical alerts will also pump into uh, PagerDuty. Call the on-call person. Maybe call me. Fix whatever's going on. <clears throat> First one on the list, Swift Drive Audit. This, I feel like, is even more critical than the last one, even the last one is more important to your customers. Swift Drive Audit is a core Swift tool that scans kernel logs for XFS corruption or XFS error messages. So for Isinga, you basically 
make a wrapper class around that that uh, runs that check, scans the logs and reports back if a drive has shown any corruptions so you know, oh, I have a failing drive on this node. Maybe if you have a larger cluster that generates a work order, take it for data center ops to go and replace that drive. You know. uh, the next part of drive audit is it can also be used to unmount a failed drive so that Swift can work around it a little bit better. And that's also a core tool. So a good thing to add to Isinga is uh, a check for unmounted drives. And you do this by using Swift Recon, which, again, another core Swift tool. The Recon endpoint is exposed on object nodes, and it just gives you a bunch of different data on like unmounted drives, uh, disk space usage, almost anything you could really want. And you can pump that, again, right into uh, Isinga. So that's check for mounted drive. Swift dispersion report is, is done by checking to see if a set of deliberately distributed containers and objects are currently in their proper places within the cluster. It's a core Swift tool. Uh, Puppet Swift helps you configure that from proxy nodes. And I have this report back up to Isinga, and it's kind of a nice high-level view of you know, our objects where they should be. If they're not, you could consider maybe there's some file system issue that's causing uh, replicas to not land where they should. Just a good top-level view of, hey, is everything OK? Async pending replication time, also important. Probably more important to track over time than just a high-level view. But if you look at Isinga, notice, hey, usually I have zero async pending, and there's 10,000. Well, you better get in the logs and find out what's going on. Then the next thing is a bunch of operating system level checks that you'd have on basically any node. File descriptors, is Puppet running properly? What's the load like? Disk space? And then, and then most importantly, from your customer's perspective, is a basic Swift CRUD check. Every 30 seconds, create, upload, delete an object. And this will be one of the, most, uh, the earliest indicators that something's gone wrong, is a check like this failing. This is what this you know, looks like in one of our environments for an object node. You can see uh, Puppet Agent, hey, it's running fine. Uh, check drives for errors, no errors found. All devices are mounted. All right, hey, this node's pretty happy. Nothing looks crazy. So that's helpful. Same thing for a proxy node. Only you can see Swift Dispersion Report output on there. Uh, next step that I'd be working on in the next few months is we actually have a Manaska installation set up in our environment. I'll work on pumping stuff in there like uh, time to put an object, uh, error rates, it, basically tracking any, any sort of request to Swift, and I can then better model the performance of the cluster, find out what's slowing it down or speeding it up at different times a day. This is a whole other bucket of work to get into and a whole other presentation, really. Final part here coming up, performance tuning. And this is performance tuning the operating system that Swift's running on, as well as actually tuning Swift itself to better fit your environment. Tuning the operating system is a very complex thing. So what I've done here for you is put together a list of sort of the top values I found. This is from uh, searching email threads, message boards, uh, the actual Swift deployment guide, the OpenStack Swift deployment guide. And some of them are pretty critical, right? Your proxy under high load might run out of connections. And now that you are deploying this with Puppet, you're sort of in charge of ensuring it has what it needs to do this. So I mean, this is, this is a couple of days of work, but you sit down, read through these, understand how they apply to your environment, adjust them, benchmark, find out does it help you. Just, just good to be aware of. Um, and again, download the slides, read through these, see if it helps you out at home. Next, though, you can performance tune at the Swift level. And there's, there's a whole lot of fun stuff you can do here if you're, if you're benchmarking your cluster. I found, for example, on an object node that had about 34 disks, I got a significant boost in performance going from uh, eight object workers to 16. I later learned you can, you can tune that up further by changing a threads per disk value even higher. And I learned this by this uh, OpenStack Swift book by uh, Joe Arnold and members of the Swift Stack team. Really, if you're going to be running a production Swift cluster, you should have read this entire book and understand it pretty thoroughly. Otherwise, there's just going to be a bunch of blind spots that you're, you're not aware of in operating Swift. So it's a great one. They pass them out for free a lot of times if you just ask them. So really well written, good info. Those guys have been working on Swift since the very beginning. Um, important part, though, is in those, those class declarations and those, those profile manifests earlier, I left out all the different parameters you can pass in. But if you look into those classes, you'll find you can tune almost any of these Swift settings in those classes. 
So you have the ability to tweak the cluster however you'd like to, to match your environment. Final piece you can't forget now that you're running Swift yourself there is log rotation and logging. That's a pretty important part that gets overlooked. Uh, by default, Swift would just log to uh, syslog. It's kind of messy. can't really split out what's going on there. Uh, Puppet has an rsyslog and log rotate module you can depend on and use. These are some examples and links to getting these uh, example files. With our syslog, you basically can break it out on, on server type. I mean, account server, an object server, and then log to that specific file so that you can come in and track um, problems on that server or narrow them down further. But you know, that's not enough. You'll need log rotate in place so that you don't fill up your root disk or your log partition and cause a bigger issue. You know, maybe rotate on a number of days or a drive si or a log size, something like that. So some work in progress stuff here um, in Puppet Swift. The first one, it's been a lot of work. It's had a lot of great feedback from the community, and I think it's pretty, pretty close to getting merged. It's the concept of managing Swift with a Swift init-based provider. Right now in Puppet, uh, there are distribution-specific providers that say, is a service started? Is it running? I need to restart the service. And they're not super graceful for Swift. Swift init is a tool built by Swift for starting and managing Swift processes. I implemented this as a custom provider of the service type. And this does things such as you know, gracefully reloading a process, allowing connections to bleed off before it restarts. And it'll allow you to also further expand into running uh, dedicated replication networks where you need to start Swift servers out of more than one configuration file. The module currently can't support that. This review should help pave the way to get that in there. I mentioned we're also running um, an erasure coding cluster. That requires storage policy support. That's not really in Puppet Swift yet. You can kind of hack it in there using Swift config if you need to. I would like to get this in in the next few months as a core feature. And then in uh, an erasure coded cluster, you actually use the Swift object reconstructor versus Swift object replicator. So uh, we need to put support in there for that and you know, kind of test it out. So more info, you can look upstream at the uh, Puppet Swift work. You can find me on IRC, um, the OpenStack operators, as well as Puppet OpenStack room as Vinch, and I can help you through this stuff. There are a, a ton of great reviewers of uh, the Puppet work, so if you, you, know, you have a change, put it up. They, there's a lot of really good feedback. There's people that work for Puppet Labs that work on OpenStack, all that, so it's a really good community. Um, so, any questions? Everything up until this is upstream. Yeah. So, okay, thanks.